In all of our lessons today, there's this element of power that happens. If you look at the Old Testament lesson, God is using a Gentile king to bring people back into God's fold. The Thessalonians are learning how to turn away from idols, the powerfulness of that, and turning toward God. And even Jesus today is talking about um, earthly powers versus God. And and, uh, as I was studying this over the past couple of weeks, I was just mindful of what's going on in our world right now and how to address it, how to talk about it, how to name things like that. I mean, things that are going on in Israel and in Gaza right now and the, with Palestinians and, and Israelis and, and things that are going on in the Ukraine um, or even things that are happening right here in America and in our political system and things that we're really struggling with. Um, all of it deals with power and how do you address that at church and without seeming contentious? And so I can't. So what we're going to do today is lift these up in prayer and hand these to God, because God knows what to do with it. We clearly don't. So let's pray. Gracious God, we ask that you watch over those that are struggling this day, and we're especially mindful of what's happening with Israel and Palestine. And we ask you to bless the leaders there, and that your peace may prevail, and that your will may be done. We ask that you watch over Ukraine that your peace may prevail and that your will may be done, and that you watch over our country and that your peace may prevail and your will be done. In your son's name we pray, amen. Amen. Today's gospel lesson is Jesus in Jerusalem. And we've already kind of gone through some of this because Jesus has come into Jerusalem. Remember, he came in on the little pony, and then he goes into the temple and he overthrows the tables. This is where they're taking the denarius and exchanging it for the temple money so that way they can go and purchase a sacrifice. And then he goes back to the temple and he's arguing with the Pharisees, and the Pharisees are trying to trap him. They're trying to get him. They're trying to make him say something so that way other people will stop following him. And he keeps turning the tables on them, and he uses parables, and he's, and he's really uh, um, challenging them and their authority. And they're getting frustrated, so much so that the Pharisees today have gone out to seek some extra help. And they go find this group of people called the Herodians. Has anybody ever heard of the Herodians before? No, because they don't get mentioned in the Bible except for right here. Both Matthew, Mark, and Luke use the same story, and it's with the Herodians here. Now, you're never going to guess who they follow. Herod, that's right. Good, good. Yes, context clues, yes. So the Herodians, but I read that they're kind of like mercenaries. These are, these are soldiers, you know. These are the people that, that really follow the Roman law. They adhere to that. They are Romans. Meanwhile, the Pharisees are the leaders of the temple. They follow the Mosaic law. They really do stand in opposition to the Herodians. So the Pharisees now, to try to trap Jesus, have decided, you know what? The enemy of my enemy is my Right, is my friend. And so they get together, and they plot to trap Jesus. And there they go, walking arm in arm up to Jesus. And they kind of butter him up a little bit, a little soft shoe to begin with. They're like, hey, Jesus, you're a great guy. You showed no difference to anybody. You show no partiality. You're so swell. Can you tell us? We're just kind of trying to figure this out, you know. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? What do you say? And Jesus knows that they're coming maliciously. He knows. In fact, if Jesus answers yes, then the Pharisees are like, ha-ha, we got you. And if Jesus answers no, then the Herodians is like, you're with us, we got you. So they're just waiting with pins and needles. What are you going to say? What are you going to say? What are you going to say? And Jesus looks at them and he says, why are you trying to test me, you hypocrites? What a great word, right, hypocrite? We all know what a hypocrite is. We use it all the time here. If you're married to someone, you know what a hypocrite is. Yes. If you have children, they know what a hypocrite is. My father was the best hypocrite of them all. He would say, do as I say, not as I. You have the same parents. Yes. Right. So we all know what a hypocrite is. But back then, it was a little different. It was a little bit more serious, the level of hypocrite. This was somebody that would be up on a stage in a full costume, even with a mask or a painted face. They were portraying someone that they weren't. And they were doing this over and over and over again. So Jesus is looking at these people that are portraying somebody that they're not. They're wearing their long robes, acting as if they're religious people, and they're portraying something that they're not. So he's calling them out. You are a hypocrite. He says, give me the coin that's used to pay the taxes. And so the Pharisee reaches into his pocket and pulls out a denarius, which is really telling. 
Because where would he find a denarius? In the temple when he was exchanging money. And now he has this denarius and he hands it to Jesus. And Jesus says, whose image is on this? By the way, the word image in the Greek is where we get the word icon for, idol, icon, like on your computer. Jesus is looking at them saying, the face on this coin is who? And they say, the emperor. The image, the graven image on it is the emperor. And what does it say on the coin? It says, Caesar, son of God. To have the graven image on something and to be having it as a Jewish person was against the Mosaic law. And to have something that said God's name on it was blasphemous. And this is in the pocket of the hypocrite, the temple elite, the Pharisee, handing it to Jesus. And so Jesus looks at this thing and says, give to the emperor the things that belong to the emperor. Give to God the things that belong to God. And in fact, the Greek really reads, give back to the emperor the things that are the emperor, give back to God the things that are God. In other words, all these things of the world that we try to put so much power into, let them have it. Let them have it all. What does it even matter? Give it to them. But the things that belong to God, what are they? Well, we heard in the children's sermon, humans, us, our very being, we have been made in the image of God. In fact, we've been given inscribed on our foreheads the cross of Christ. We have this image on us, and all God wants is us. And we put all kinds of things in front of us, don't we, that that, that, that take precedent, that take power, that take purpose and reason in front of us. We put it all the time. And every time that I do that, when I start to look at other things as the direction of, of, of what I'm giving myself to, it's terrible. Things don't work. I'm usually, not, I'm usually frustrated or I'm upset or things aren't happening. But as soon as I turn toward God and I'm asking God, what do you want of me? And I'm trying to give everything back to God. The results are divine because they're not mine. Give back to God the things that are God. It's you. Paul writes to the Thessalonians in our New Testament lesson today. He and Silas had already visited Thessalonica, which, by the way, your Jeopardy fact for the day is Thessalonica was named after Alexander the Great's sister. Just put that in your pocket for later. So (laughs) Paul Paul and Silas, in the book of Acts, go visit Thessalonica, and they establish a church. The first church is built there. And things are going great. People are coming, and they're learning more about God, and they're learning more about the Messiah who's going to return. However, the Greco-Roman powers that be find out about it And they start to persecute these people that are meeting together peacefully. And so Paul and Silas flee. So this letter is written after that. Paul's writing to thank them for their witness because apparently, despite persecution, the church in Thessalonica is flourishing. They're growing in numbers. People are coming to work. It doesn't matter if people are after them. And he's like, you guys have been able to turn away from all the Greco-Roman gods, all these other idols all these other emperors, and turn toward God. Somehow, someway, y'all have been able to do this. And he thanks them for their witness, that they keep bringing more to God, more to Christ. In other words, he's thanking them because they are giving back to God the things that are God's. There are many things that are in our way today. We live in a world that is struggling right now, and we can get so focused on what's wrong The beautiful thing is what's right and what's good and what's holy and what's just and what's sacred is right here. It's within each and every one of us. And today we're being invited, give to God the things that are God's.